Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. The date is June 15th, 1776. The place is the city of New York. The backdrop is the first year of the American Revolution. Things are still quite in disarray as the uh, Continental Army, now uh, housed inside the city of New York, is awaiting the landing and likely siege and invasion of the city by British troops that have been driven out of Boston. The scene that we find is Thomas Hickey, a soldier in the Continental Army who actually up until this date, has held a special place. He's part of an elite group known as the Life Guard. They're a small unit of soldiers who are personally responsible for guarding the life of the commander-in-chief, one George Washington. Where we find them, though, is in jail. Hickey and another member of the Life Guard, Michael Lynch, have been arrested for passing counterfeit money. And on June 15th, while they are in jail they begin to tell a tale to one of the other prisoners that's there, one Isaac Ketchum, about a plot that they've been involved in, a very important plot. It's a plot to do a very important thing. It's a plot to kill George Washington. It's not just these two soldiers that are involved. The mayor of the city of New York, the royal governor of New York, who is loyal to the crown, as well as a variety of military officers and other leading citizens of the city, Perhaps even Washington's own housekeeper, a woman by the name of Mary Smith, appear to be part of a plot which is intended to isolate the city of New York and as part of the process to decapitate the head of the Continental Army, one George Washington, the commander-in-chief. A few days later, on June 26th, Hickey is court-martialed and, once found guilty of treason, is sentenced by General Washington along with several of the others that are involved in the conspiracy, to be publicly hanged. 20,000 citizens of New York come out to see the public spectacle of the hanging, and the plot, which has now been detected, comes to an end. Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. I'm Don Shelley, your host. Glad you could join us for this episode, where we're going to focus on the historical what-if around the father of the United States, George Washington the commander-in-chief, the first president, among the most influential of the founding fathers. And as you can tell from the history that was just related there, there was that moment in June of 1776 when things in the midst of that first year of the revolution could have turned out very differently. And the revolution would not have had George Washington at its head leading the Continental Army. So we're going to explore that as our fork today in the timeline of history. What would have happened if... In June of 1776, George Washington had been assassinated. Before we explore the alternate path, a good place to start is to follow down the path of the things that were accomplished by Washington and why he is so highly regarded in American history. Obviously, at the time of the plot against him, he had been named commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. Uh, While obviously a prestigious post, it was a challenging post. Uh, Resources were virtually non-existent. Uh, Support was scattered and sometimes varied. It was difficult uh, not only to gather together troops, but to arm those troops, train those troops, feed and supply those troops. Uh, He was not the commander-in-chief of skilled professional soldiers, such as he faced on the British side, but in fact he was the leader of a ragtag group of militia and other folks who had come to the aid of the Continental cause. Uh, To say the least, he was not in charge of the most professional and most trained army that existed in North America at the time. Beyond that, there had not even been a declaration of independence, actually, at the time that this event occurred. That would occur the next month in July of 1776. This was in June of 1776. And while the colonial forces had been victorious in liberating Boston... Uh, The expectation was that a very large force 
of British soldiers which were there in the harbor and would soon be landing in New York uh, were about to uh, take retribution for that action and make sure that the most populous and in some ways the most important city in the colonies was put back firmly under British control. In August of 1776, the Battle of Long Island, sometimes called the Battle of Brooklyn or the Battle of Brooklyn Heights, would actually see the American forces defeated and forced to retreat, leaving New York firmly in the hands of British control and leaving the Continental Army on the run, looking for shelter and looking for supplies. A situation that would exist over the following year, eventually resulting in uh, the famous wintering at Valley Forge in, in 1777. All of these events are important because at the helm of the Continental Army was Washington. He possesses a number of unique attributes. He's a Virginian, a landed Virginian, but not an overly wealthy Virginian. He has military experience uh, from his younger days as a youth and as a young man serving in uh, colonial forces under British command in the French and Indian War. He has the stature and the temperament uh, to deal with the conflict that exists, not just with the enemy, but within his own camp and within the own ranks of the Revolution. Uh, as one biographer would later describe him, he is the indispensable man. And so, if there isn't a Washington uh, after the events of June 1776, one begins to wonder how things might have worked and what might have happened. After the war, Washington, who was not one who liked the spotlight, uh, nevertheless found himself pressed into service uh, after the failures of the Articles of Confederation to be an effective form of government for the new colonies to actually be the president of the Constitutional Convention, leading to what ultimately would be the Constitution, including defending and pushing for the ratification of that Constitution, which would allow for an effective form of government, uh, a form of government that eventually would allow the colonial situation to emerge from the debts that had been accrued during the war and to gain a firm footing on the world stage as a new nation on a new continent. More than one historian has argued that during the entire time of the Constitutional Convention when they were discussing the role of an executive, the role of who would lead the country when they were not going to have a king in that role, that uh, any of the participants there in the, in the Constitutional Convention couldn't help but look at the man that was sitting at the head of the meeting, the person who was chairing the meeting, George Washington himself, and realizing that that was probably going to be the first president, and thinking through what it would be like to have that man with that skill set, with that temperament sitting in the office. And for many of the participants that were there who had very diverse interests and who had a number of areas that they were not in agreement upon, Many of them were very quick to agree that they could work in a nation where George Washington would be the first president. Of course, Washington did assume that role, the first president of the United States under the Constitution, and led the United States through a very difficult time, concluding a peace treaty to settle the peace now uh, after having gained independence from Britain, also dealing with the early clashes of the role between the federal government and the state governments, in terms of figuring out how the new nation would work and what would be the roles of each of the various levels of government in that new, newly formed government, in that newly formed constitution. He was able to gather men of diverse interests, uh, from an Alexander Hamilton to a John Adams to a Thomas Jefferson, uh, to serve in different roles, Adams being his vice president uh, from Massachusetts, uh, both uh, Hamilton being from New York, um, others that held high office, for example, Jefferson, who was also a fellow Virginian, he was able to create a mechanism that by his cabinet and by his appointments and by those that were in the early positions of authority inside of the administration, he's able to create a workable government. In fact, one of the most challenging aspects of looking at this particular alternate history or counterfactual is actually trying to imagine what it would be like with Washington not there, the vacuum of Washington. Washington filled so many of these roles, but he did so in such a way that was not with a, a lot of pomp, not a lot of circumstance. It was very matter-of-factly and done very subtly, uh, done with a lot of skill, done with a lot of uh, acumen in terms of understanding how to persuade and how to drive compromise. 
And so it's difficult to imagine exactly what would have happened in some of the instances if there had not been someone with the temperament of Washington. There may have been people that had better skills for some of the individual things that Washington did, but Washington was uniquely equipped, uh, most biographers and historians agree, in terms of his temperament and in terms of his ability to unify and find common ground among diverse uh, folks that were part of his war council or part of his cabinet. And so Washington's influence is difficult to measure or think of in his absence because of how subtle and how effective it was. And not a lot of fanfare, but Washington managed to perform the role with a great deal of class and also with a great deal of dignity. One of the first things we might look at is what would have happened during the actual war effort without Washington. There are probably other generals who were equally as competent or maybe even more competent uh, than Washington. Uh, Nathaniel Green comes to mind, certainly the role that uh, the Marquis de Lafayette uh, paid in the Revolution. Uh, can't ha- think today of the modern musical Hamilton without also realizing that Hamilton uh, had some military skill, in, uh, certainly in the area of espionage. Washington was not a military genius, per se, but he certainly understood the genius of being able to draw upon the capabilities and skills of the generals that were underneath his command and had a very keen sense not only of the tactical needs of an individual battle and sometimes the needs of executing things that were daring. One can't help but think of uh, the Christmas raid uh, that is so famously immortalized as they are crossing the Delaware uh, on boats uh, to surprise British forces on Christmas Day but also in situations like Valley Forge and other situations where the tactics may need to be defensive while producing an overall strategic offensive strategy. So again, it's not the case of military genius, but it's the case of understanding the practical application and also using the skills of those that were underneath him. It is possible to imagine that someone like Nathaniel Green might have been able to carry on and have been successful as the military commander carrying out the rest of the revolution. But whether Green or many of the others who would have been the military men who could have uh, filled the vacuum that Washington would have left actually during the Revolutionary War are probably not the same temperament or not the same men who would have been able to be successful in the other endeavors uh, that are so powerful in terms of Washington's narrative and in terms of his impact on the United States. After victory is achieved at Yorktown and independence is gained, the new nation uh, continues to function under the Articles of Confederation, uh, which was a loose association of the, of the states. To call them the United States may be better described as being the states united because the states were still the most powerful political entities Uh, in the territory uh, that comprised the United States. And the federal government or the central government, as it existed under the Articles of Confederation, had very little authority and very little power. As a result of some of the inefficiencies and the problems that that created, eventually a constitutional convention is called, although it's not intended to be a constitutional convention, it's intended to be a convention that's going to rework the elements of the Articles of Confederation that are not working well. Uh, But once the convention is gathered and begins the debate process, the process that we know today that produces the Constitution uh, through a variety of the influential figures of the American Revolution and the Founding Fathers, folks like Hamilton and Madison, Madison being known as the architect of the Constitution, uh, brought forth. The person sitting at the head of that meeting is the hero from the Revolutionary War, the one man that everyone could have confidence in leading this particular convention and doing so in a fair and impartial way even though he did favor a stronger central government, that's Washington. So Washington's role, although not overt, because as the chairman and presiding officer of the convention, he was not the one that was engaged in debate and discussion and putting forth his various plans for what the new government looked like, but certainly had a role in guiding and setting the tone and the temperament of the Constitutional Convention. Um, It's a unique thing in history that happens with the formation of the United States Constitution in that it was the creation of a document in a way that had never actually happened before like that in the course of history. And so the man that's leading that process, although not vocally, but certainly leading it by his presence, leading it by his temperament, leading it by the guidance that he's giving is George Washington. 
and certainly more than one historian has pointed to the fact that at the various times that they were thinking about uh, the role of this executive uh, inside of the Constitution, the idea of this uh, position of President of the United States, it's hard to imagine that the uh, delegates there at the convention looking up at the head table aren't imagining the very likely and almost expected outcome that Washington would be the first one to hold that office and thinking about what that office meant in terms of Washington being its occupant occupant, and that giving them confidence in moving forward with putting together this constitution that would empower a central authority, uh, a federal government, uh, with more authority than, uh, than they had had under the Articles of Confederation. It's also important to note that at, at any point uh, there had been calls for, and the possibility would have existed after the Revolutionary War, or even at this particular point, for installing Washington as a monarch. Everyone agreed that because of his temperament, he would make a good king. But the Revolution had been fought over not having a king and having a different form of representation, a different form of government. And so Washington's refusal, when it would have been potentially possible for him to just assume the role of uh, a de facto king for the newly independent uh, America, would have uh, would have produced a very different outcome in history. So without Washington there, as there's a vacuum uh, at the Constitutional Convention, or as there's a vacuum in terms of um, what's going to happen with uh, a more effective government that can now govern these independent colonies, or them just remaining independent states with their own devices and their own independent desires, probably would be a very different scenario without a Washington there in that role in the Constitutional Convention. And certainly the argument can be made that once the Constitution is ratified and the first president is elected, we see as Washington is unanimously elected, uh, something that has never happened uh, in the history of the United States except for that event as the first person to occupy the office of president of the United States. As president, Washington finds himself in the unique position of being the first man to occupy a newly created office. While the Constitution did provide certain powers to be invested in the chief executive, uh, one of the brilliant elements, as most political scientists and historians will tell you, of the United States Constitution was that it was not (laughs) definitive on a number of points. It left open a number of issues. And so there are questions to be answered about how the role is to work, uh, how the government is actually supposed to function, uh, what will be the roles of the various folks that are inside the government, the various secretaries and other and other officials that will make up this new government of the United States. Uh, Probably the most lasting impact of Washington and the presidency is that Washington's occupancy of the presidency was not lasting. He chose, after two terms, uh, to remove himself from office voluntarily, to not seek a third term. And even as he was exiting the office, uh, we can see this in his farewell address, he was making the efforts to lay the groundwork for a form of government and a way of carrying the government forward that would not be based around parties or around sectionalism or around the things that would divide the new young nation but the things that would bring it together. So regardless of which of Washington's roles you view as being most vital, the commander-in-chief, the quiet leader who influences the events between the end of the revolution and the founding of the constitutional United States, the man who sat at the head of the Constitutional Convention, or the man who occupied the office of president first. Whichever of those you view as being most influential, it's important to remember that with a different outcome there in June of 1776, Washington would not have been the man who was available uh, for any of those roles. And especially when you think of all of those things pulled together, combined together, uh, it's easy to imagine Uh, why uh, he has been called the indispensable man and uh, not being dispensed with in June of 1776 certainly had an impact on history as we know it. So thanks for joining us today on A Fork in Time. If you've enjoyed the podcast and uh, would like to provide support uh, to help defray some of the costs and make it something that we can sustain, certainly visit us on our Patreon page uh, at A Fork in Time. Uh, You'll find links to that here in the show notes. And join us again next time uh, when we'll pursue another particular moment in history and see how things might have been different if there had been a fork in time.
Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Join us next time.